I am going to be talking more about the speech, the camp model for, um, for providing speech therapy to children with repaired cleft palate. It's one that we have trialed ourselves and continue to so for, since 2018. And it's one that has potential in um, various countries in Africa to actually have additional impact as I will talk more about why we arrived at that additional model for delivery of speech therapy to our children with repaired cleft palate. Okay. So this is how today's lecture is going to unfold if I don't do too many detours of the, the outline. So I'll talk more about the indication for speech therapy for this population and the effects the palate or the existing, you know, like palate in the, I mean, cleft in the palate has on, on speech as well as language skills for the children that we do see and why we decided to trial a camp model. It's a week long camp model and I'll talk more about that model, its pros and cons and, and I'll answer questions if there'll be any. So I believe it's pretty much an undisputed fact that cleft care does go beyond surgical management for children or persons with cleft lip and palate. So the surgery is definitely critically important, but after the surgery, cleft therapy, I mean, cleft speech therapy is equally as important as well as all the other teams that are involved in the rehabilitation or the habilitation journey for, for children that find themselves with a cleft or born with a cleft lip and palate. So what researchers have actually identified is that children born with cleft lip and palate do also present with other expressive, so expressive the way you speak. So that could be language or it could be the mechanics, the speech of how you pronounce sounds in, um, in words. So researchers have actually found that this population does also carry comorbidity in either, you know, just the expressive language skills that they present with or the acquisition of sounds and words seems to be at a much slower pace compared to the other population. So the typically developing population. And so we found that children that have cleft lip and palate do have a restricted inventory of sounds from infancy and that just surgery alone is not usually enough to put them back on a trajectory of timely speech and language or acquisition of speech and language milestones. So most evident are errors in production in speech production seen in this population. And these errors mostly are, you know, in consonant production. So the, the way in which they produce consonant sounds, and I'll talk more about the consonants that are typically more impacted. So the way in which they produce consonants is usually atypical compared to the other, you know, the rest of the population. They also have, or they present with abnormal nasal airflow. So there's air that seems to leak out for obvious reasons. That division between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity was had a, a cleft, so was actually missing. They also have persistent resonance issues. I might not have enough time to talk about resonance issues, but I'll I'll tell you where you can get additional information about this, and that is through the course that um, is on offer to anybody in your in your institution in your countries for free so to improve your knowledge and you know just your ability to assess and offer evidence-based speech therapy to this population so i'll talk more about that so they also present with altered voice quality and they might have a lot of the nasal grimaces and facial grimaces as a result so how we typically categorize, there's many ways, as you will see in the follow-on slides, that there's many ways in which the errors 
that this population present with are categorized, but you probably hear the term obligatory versus compensatory errors. And these are usually errors that, or this is a way we categorize these errors post the surgical intervention. So any errors that a child continues to present with after the operation can either be categorized as obligatory or compensatory. And I'll talk more about this, but as the name suggest, suggest obligatory errors are errors that they can't help make. Yeah, so they are making them because there's something that is either um, inadequate or insufficient in, um, in, in, in their presentation that is forcing them to make these errors. So it could be the presence of a fistula, for example, or it could be uh, they might have additional uh, perhaps hearing difficulties that is forcing them not to continue having these errors because they probably are not perceiving the sounds correctly. Then compensatory errors are the errors that are really are the child has are more habitual. So the child has, is, was used to making these errors before the intervention, the surgical intervention, and they continue to persist, not because there is actually a limitation or a dysfunction, it just that it was habitual and they just need to now have a bit of therapy to, to get them to correct them. So just so you know, the errors that can be corrected through behavioral intervention, which speech therapy is, is actually just a compensatory error. So I don't know, I've probably spoken more about it here, but there is more to come, I believe. So to set the stage, let us, I want us to go through the types of sounds that are present in English language. I haven't had the opportunity to assess or evaluate or categorize the sounds of the phonemes in some of the other native languages that are spoken in Kenya, which is where I am from, which is where I practice as well. And I don't know if any of you or either of you in your institutions, maybe at the university, whether you have profiled, I'm sure the Department of Linguistics would have a profile of the, the sounds that are present in the languages that are spoken in your country. But for English, which is actually the language that we mostly use in our camps, in our therapy sessions, although we do also use Kiswahili, but just for illustration purposes, for English, there are approximately 45 phonemes in the entire English language. And the phonemes, the sounds, so phonemes are sounds, they are made up of consonant sounds. So consonants are your B, C, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, M, N, P, Q, R, S, T, V, W, X, Y, and Z. So those are the consonant sounds, it's a quick linguistic class. And there's also vowels and the vowels are subcategorized according to whether they are short vowel sounds and whether or whether they are long vowel sounds. So this is for English. Now in Kiswahili, we tend to not have the same categorization for the vowel sounds that we mostly have the short vowel sounds. So it's a bit different and I'm sure it's going to be different for your other languages as well. So the long vowel sounds have a special name. They're called diphthongs. And that just means there are two vowels that are acting as a single phoneme. But when you say them, you actually stretch them out. So when you're saying the word boy, so boy contains a, con a consonant b, so b, and it also contains a vowel sound oi, but it's different from a word such as bot, bot being, I don't know, that um, in like tech term, like a bot or let's, let's do another word. So mop, for example. So mop has a short vowel sound o, which is different from boy, which has a long vowel sound oi, which is also referred to as a diphthong. So these sounds, we always will target all the different variations of phonemes that the child is supposed to know for the language that they speak. And making these distinctions is very key. So for children who have cleft lip and palate, consonant sounds are what are primarily affected, although there are instances where the vowel sounds or other sounds or some, there are instances, so vowel sounds are usually not typically affected, but there are instances like in the case of 
the presence of a resonance disorder, which vowel sounds, we can see vowel sounds being affected. Now, not all consonant sounds are usually impacted by the presence of a cleft, but mostly what's referred to as high pressure sounds. Now, there are many confusing ways of categorizing these sounds, but for a speech therapist, this is really important because it helps us you know, anticipate the errors and it also helps us you know, know how to target them precisely so that they can, they can resolve fully. So the, of all the consonant sounds, there is a group of consonant sounds referred to as high pressure sounds, and I'll talk more about that in the next slide, that are the most affected when, when a child has a, a cleft. But they are also a subsidiary of those consonant sounds referred to as low pressure consonant sounds that are not usually as affected, but they can be affected. And then the nasal sounds are also consonant sounds that don't tend to be affected. And those are just mostly three sounds. So M for Mary, N for November, and NG, the NG the, that appears at the end of words like song and ing ing so the ng sound is usually not as affected i mean they are consonant sounds but usually never affected and i'll explain to you why so let's look at this categorization or rather just a breakdown of sounds in english so if you speak any language other than english you should start to think about what phonemes exist in your in your language and which of those are could be categorized as high pressure and which of those could be categorized as low pressure and as nasals. So nasal sounds, the ones that are in the middle there, as I said, m, n, and n, are sounds that when you say them, there is air that comes out of the nasal cavity. So I can say either one of those sounds with my mouth closed and I'll still be able to say it. So as in no air is coming out through my mouth, in actual fact, all the air comes out of the nose. So, mm, mm. so my, my lips are apart, but actually no air is coming out. So you could try this as well. Mm. The air only comes out through the nose and mm, the air again coming out through the nose. Now, so nasal sounds are not usually affected because the we don't need the, the velopharyngeal port, which is where there's a separation between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. I wish I actually had a diagram here of the, of the anatomy of you know, the pharynx. So basically at the throat where your, the end, so that's the posterior pharyngeal wall. And this here is the nose, the nasal cavity, and this here is the mouth, which usually leads down to, you know, to the voice, the, vo the vocal cords, which are down below, and the glottis, which is down below. So when you're doing a sound or producing a sound that's a nasal, this port actually stays open. So it stays open for a sound like mm, like right now my port is open, n mm, and mm. It also sort of stays open marginally for the other set of sounds that are the low pressure sounds, and those are on this chart here, the liquids and the glides. So liquids and glides almost behave like vowels. Actually, the glides more be, behave more like vowels, the were and the year, and the liquids have more than one place in the mouth where they are produced. So they're almost, you know, a little fluid, but they don't tend to be impacted by this port. So this port can be open. You can still say a little sound. They're not nasal, but they're not usually as impacted, but there are children who will have this as, you know, problematic. So that's, those are the high pressure, I mean, the low pressure sound, the liquids and the glides, and then the nasal sounds, the ones that the port stays open. Now for the rest of the sounds, the stops, and they, they, they have that funny name stops, that's based on the manner in which they are made in the mouth, yeah? And which articulators are, in, are um, called upon to make to produce those sounds. So stops are sounds that require a complete stop in the flow of air. And then usually they require a bit of intraoral buildup of pressure and then a release or a burst 
or a plosive. So they're also called plosives. So a stop, when you're saying any one of those sounds, a p, a ba, a ta, a da, a ka, a ga, there's actually a complete separation of the oral cavity and the nasal cavity because all the air needs to be stopped from leaking out into the nasal cavity. And instead, it needs to all flow out through the oral cavity, through the mouth. So it is held in the mouth temporarily and then it is exploded out. So I just held it a little in my mouth and then I exploded. And for me to be able to sufficiently be able to hold and build sufficient intraoral oral pressure and then burst it out, you see how it's important that we have a vacuum system and that there's no air that is allowed to leak out through the nasal cavity. If air leaks out for whatever reason, either there's just a dysfunction or a, you know an insufficiency in this closure here, the velopharyngeal port, or there is a fistula, so there's a hole, or there's actually a complete cleft, you can see how we cannot build up enough intraoral pressure. So the production of that plosive is going to sound very deflated. It's going to be a, huh, I'm all leaking out through the nose. It's just not very crisp. So all of these sounds, the stops, the fricatives don't require a stop, but they require continuous flow of air, but all the air is actually coming out through the oral cavity. The affricates are a, a mixture of a stop and a fricative. So there's a bit of a stop and then a flow. So these, so let's so see the difference. So the fricatives, so the stops, there's a complete stop. P fricatives, f I can keep going and keep going and keep going. S those are fricatives, then the affricates. There's almost a stop and then a complete, then we continue on. So, ch, ch, yeah, and j. So, and there's also j and a few others. And in your languages, they're probably going to be more. So for all of those types of sounds, we do require that the air comes up through the oral cavity. And those are the sounds that are typically impacted by the presence of a cleft, or they're the ones that would be most likely that or the children will most likely have compensatory errors on. So yes, everything has been sorted. The, surg the surgery was successful, but they're still having persistent issues with those. Typically it will be just those ones, the, the high pressure sounds. So we refer to them as high pressure sounds because they require a bit of pressure and all the air needs to come up through the mouth. So all these sounds here are 45. Now the bottom band there has blends and those blends are a mixture of two consonants together. And the consonants could be from different types of sounds. So like the R in English, we normally have blends, R blends, S blends and L blends. So the R blends are words like broom, where these are con two consonants together side by side and then the vowel and another consonant at the end or not. And you see how the bur is a stop and the R is actually a liquid. So this child, although they might not have problems saying a word that's just a, li a liquid alone, like row, because that's just R and a vowel, but if I added a B sound and becomes bro, there might be issues there that need to also be targeted separately. So that I think is a pretty comprehensive explanation for the types of sounds that exist in English language. So as a speech therapist, or if you are resolving errors in this population in your centers, it is, and you speak or the children speak other languages other than English, then it's important that you are able to subcategorize all those sounds that exist in that language so that you are able to see which sounds your children might have more uh, difficulty articulating. So as a rule of thumb, there are 17 phonemes in English language that children in this population may find difficult. But there are also, if you add to the blends, there, it then there's an additional 26 phonemes that you also need to worry about. And if we are to be very idealistic and and very generalist really, and say that one error, it might require 
about six to 10 sessions if all conditions were ideal. This is a textbook child, attendance is textbook, and they have no comorbidities, then it might take six to 10 sessions to be able to remediate just the one error, simply because there's actually a hierarchy, what's referred to as an articulation therapy hierarchy that has to be adhered to, so that the errors actually end up being resolved permanently. Failure to which you find that this child is able to say that sound correctly without those compensatory errors at word level, but then when they are saying a, a, they are engaged in a conversation, then it all sort of falls apart. So there is a very stringent, stringent way in which you have to target each error, but it doesn't mean that you have to target all those errors in the same format for them to, you know, like you might have to do the first two errors and then after that the child is able to generalize or able to sort of just they've got it and then it seems to be resolving itself for the other types of errors without you specifically targeting doesn't always happen so this is textbook so if you're needing six to ten sessions for one single phoneme then imagine if this child has all the errors that we expect children that have uh, in this population to have, that you might then need to have upwards of 102 sessions. If you're just going to target 17 phonemes and, and say no generalization takes place and you have to target the rest, you know, so you'll need upwards of 102 sessions. And that in itself sounds like it's quite a lot of work. And I think this is where the, and I mean, like, this can end up being very costly and it can end up being more costly than even the surgery that happens even you know just the first surgery being the lip one and then the 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 palate one because those are one-off events whereas therapy is actually an ongoing event it's there's a whole journey that can end up being very costly not just for the funder smile train for example but also for the parent in terms of attendance and consistency because as much as the therapy is offered free to them they also do have other needs that are not that, that probably get challenged in the um, in the process so let's talk a little bit about what these types of errors are i just i know that the lecture is more on the camp model but i feel just a bit of background information helps just set the stage for understanding why the camp model then works or rather it has worked for us so the effects of or rather the errors that we do see in this population are all or mostly to do with the effect of you know this port here the posterior pharyngeal wall and the villum that needs to approximate so this villopharyngeal port and its dysfunction and how that impacts on speech production. So a lot of the children we see end up having the leakage and the leakage could be compensatory. You know, the leakage could actually end up being something of, you know, more structural, you know, so then in that case, it becomes, you know, a resonance. So there's another name for that. It, the errors can be compensatory. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the compensatory errors we commonly see or are associated with cleft lip and palate, or mostly cleft palate. And the obligatory misarticulations that, as I said, behavioral intervention is unable to resolve. So obligatory errors are those that are, are as a result of structural or physiological issue in the child and they require surgery or or some other type of intervention. So because some of the obligatory errors are maybe to do with the child is probably experiencing experiencing conductive hearing loss and there's no amount of speech therapy can actually resolve that unless the conductive hearing loss is managed by an audiologist and then as i said there's a resonance disorder so resonance and i'll not have time to talk about this in this lecture is the altered or, or rather the the sound energy that is as a result of you know like every sound has its own resonance that it carries that is dictated by how that sound moves from the vocal tract to the pharynx and then its involvement with the nasal cavity and the, and the, and the oral cavity. So if it's a nasal sound, we expect that there's mostly just the vocal tract that is involved and then the nasal cavity because that's where the air is supposed to be ex uh, expelled out. And for a sound like, mm, I mean, that's 
vocal so the vocal cords come together because it's a voiced sound so there are little little aspects about each sound that then create or help make that sound sound as it should so any any failure to which alters the resonance of that sound so there are children who despite having attended speech therapy we still find like they're not sounding as they should for various reasons and this is obviously impacted also by by hearing by adenoids uh, enlarged adenoids by the presence of tonsils so many other things by also the presence of say other language disorders like apraxia so yes we expect that typically children who have cleft in their in their palates will show or present with these compensatory misarticulations but there are also additional errors that they might present with that are not just you know confined to these so if these children might and these are all mostly speech related so in the first slide i did say that there's also other language issues that these children might that, that might present with some of them will have language delays they might be late talkers they might have Vocab poor vocabulary, they might have grammar issues, they might have incoordinated muscles, that's apraxia, and we have encountered quite a, quite a number of children actually that this is an additional er area that, or area of difficulty that just targeting these alone is not enough and actually you might just find that additional error that they have or difficulty that they have will impact with how successful you are with targeting these misarticulations. So what are these misarticulations? The most common ones I would say would be the, the nasal emissions, actually that's not here, just air coming out and that just requires you teaching the child the placement and the manner in which that sound is made and that normally, and then giving them a lot of tactile feedback and visual feedback to be able to self-correct. So glottal stops are sounds that or are producing error in the diff, in a in a location other than where they should. So a child might instead of saying a per sound, which is a stop, instead of producing it here with the two lips, they might produce it here, and it's going to sound like they did say it. So instead of saying the word pot, so those two sounds, the per and the ta, are both stop sounds. I had to stop for both. If the child is actually saying them with a glottal stop, it's going to be produced down here at the level of the glottis, and it's going to sound like a oh. And you're like, oh, but this child did not say the sound. Actually, they did. If you listen carefully, there's a oh. It's a voiced sound that is produced because they couldn't achieve this, the closure here because of the, the existing cleft. So they, they realize this is the only place they could actually achieve closure. So they then produce the stop there. Oh. So that one, we encounter a lot of children with those errors and those I find pretty easy to, to manage for those children quite quickly. Then the other type of errors are pharyngeal fricatives. Remember fricatives are the sounds that flow on. So if instead of saying a sound which has, is a fricative, if this child is producing it in the pharynx, so a little bit sort of back, it's going to sound, it's going to have a wet or a sloshy sound to it. So this is how you would describe those French sounds. So <laughs> the French interpreters are doing a much better job than me. So a word like, I can't think of a word right now. Shahi. So that obviously was an R, but it sounded so any, and in Kenya, there are dialects where they produce a lot of fric pharyngeal fricatives. So can't say it. Yeah. So it's produced at the pharynx and it's sort of more wet and sloshy. So if a child is producing an S, which is supposed to be crisp in that manner, then we know to help with where they are going to produce it so they can make it sound better. And then you can have pharyngeal stops as well. So the per is sounding more sloshy. So that needs to be produced better or in a better, for mid into a better quality stop. So a per sound that isn't pharyngeal. And then there's another type of error. So there's just so much lingo with cleft speech therapy. And I guess this is also the reason why 
you know, that course for cleft for clinicians that are interested in working in this population comes in handy because you find it's such a it's such a specialized area of speech therapy that even speech therapies that have gone through the, quali the their training in college, this is not an area that is normally a focus of their training, particularly if the institutions where you did your training didn't have a faculty member that was actually specialized in this area. So there are many, many confusing terms, but they all just make sense and they help in categorizing those errors and they help you better target those errors because you can hear them, you're like, oh, you classify them and then you know what to do. So amid dorsum palatal stop, that complicated name mostly just refers to sounds that are produced sort of, you know, mid midway back or forward to where they're supposed to. So for example, a cut sound, which is a stop, is produced at the back of the throat, yeah? So in an area called the villum, so where the soft palate is. So if you, instead of producing that sound here, you produce it forward, but sort of halfway there, so halfway along the roof of the mouth, it's going to be a mid dorsum palatal stop. It's a bit different than a k. So the k was right where it's supposed to be produced, but if you say, huh, it's almost come here and it has probably been implicated by the fact that I, in I, when I said, I also did have a nasal emission. So if that child comes to us that is saying a huh, like that, we need to help them be able to first of all produce it in the mouth or it's because it's an oral sound and then move the placement of what the contact, the articulators back to the right place so that it sounds like a better sound, a lot of work. It sounds like a lot of work. Another example of a mid dorsum palatal stop would be if you were to produce a purr or a burr sound, which needs the lips, but then you, instead of producing it there, you produce it, so these are the lips, you produce it sort of halfway back, then it's going to, it's going to be a mid dorsum palatal stop. And you have children who present with nasal rustle and the just little sounds that you can hear, a bit of rustling in the, in the nasal cavity that again, impacts on the resonance of that sound and needs to be targeted. And then co-articulation or co-production is where a sound, you can see the purr is being produced with the lips, but then it sounds different. So it's, you have, you have used the right placement, but then the sound has sounded different. So you've done almost two things in one. So as a speech therapist, it is up to us to you know, really put on our invest investigators, you know, sort of cap and listen very keenly and have the right skill set really to be able to discern what the child is doing and then be able to correct it. So there's just a lot that needs to, to be done before this child then is able to produce all the sounds or it, for us to be able to improve their intelligibility, how well we understand what they say. So why did we decide to go with a camp model? So we, whilst we still do offer speech therapy via, you know, obviously our partnership with SmileTrain, so via weekly sessions, the weekly sessions were not as impactful for a number of, a number of children. And we found that we were missing out on, you know, like many children that, couldn't attend our weekly sessions either because they lived very far from the treatment center. So in Nairobi, that's where HSA and Reed Clinic is situated. Not everyone that has a cleft lip or cleft palate resides in Nairobi. So they are very scattered about and mostly within the, the main capital centers, so speech therapy practices. And really in Nairobi, the majority of the clinics are situated in Nairobi, like I'd say 90%. There's probably very minimal presence in some of the other little cities, not even, the, you know, or some of the other, you know, bigger cities, but Nairobi obviously is a capital city. So we just found we had children who are traveling for even 600 kilometers to come to therapy. And if we are expecting that they're going to attend twice weekly therapy sessions so that they don't stay in therapy forever. Remember we talked about just how many phonemes need to be targeted, how many of the misarticulations also need to be targeted. So you can expect that if the child needs 
a minimum of 102 sessions that they would need to be attending twice weekly sessions for them to be done within within a year now remember there's also a very high chance that they will require more than 102 sessions so this model the weekly model whilst yes marriage train has trialed it in not just nairobi i'm sure in other countries as well it does actually carry quite a huge financial load if the cost for therapy for one child is going to you know like it's going to be triple quadruple that for even just a um, surgical intervention and the cost of running the program you know is also uh, impacted with the way we run the weekly sessions just so that we could manage the costs overall for smile train is is through group a group model so the group model uh, we have the children in a group and sometimes the children are not well matched in, in terms of age and in terms of what it is that they are struggling with so you just find that that also can impact so we try as much as possible to match children according to the ages and also according to how attentive or you know their behavior and also what it is that they're struggling with but you still find that it's not an absolute science so we thought why not try a speech camp model so the speech camp model that we've trialed now for the last two years, three years, this year we haven't done much because of COVID, obviously. But so it's a it's a week long program, which is what five days. And they we offer it three times a year during the school holidays. So whatever is the designated school holiday in Kenya, that's what we use because then the children are off school, those that are in boarding schools, even those that just attend, you know, day school at least the parent is able to bring their child for five days. And so the three, we've done it most, we've done it over April, August, and, and then in November. So this year, as I said, we haven't done it. And with, the, with our model, we've also, we give every child an opportunity to attend up to three, three camps. Now, it has always, it has just been trial and error. So we found that there are times that a child might come in and we are not able to sufficiently first of all you're never going to sufficiently exhaust the um, the intervention just during one five day camp so we always there's always an opportunity for them to attend again and then attend again but then after the third one they if there are other children that are needing to be seen then we give an opportunity to other children to also experience that so we recruit generally between 20 and 25 participants and we normally will get them from you know sources like our referral sources some of the camps that have run the the surgical camps they would have the children that have attended the camps they've had their cleft repaired and so they go on the database of those institutions and we liaise with them so like the camps that we've conducted in nairobi we've conducted them at a hospital about uh, I would say it's about 50 kilometers of, yeah, about 50 kilometers from Nairobi city. And they have hostels within like walking distance to the institution. And they, they, uh, they have collaborated with Smile Train or rather Smile Train is able to pay them to provide the, the venue and the hosting of the families because the families come in and they spend an entire week or an entire five days at the center and they are their accommodation is catered for and their meals are also catered for by this institution and then they also provide us with a hall so this is i think on this is definitely on day one i think on day one where we come with our beans and all our resources and our therapists are there ready to get started and this is actually a, a hall, a small hall, and we have access to tables and chairs. And that is where we spend five days. So usually Mondays to, to Fridays, although we have actually run them from Sundays, Sunday to Thursday, I think usually in April, so that if there is um, a holiday that is conflicting. And most parents are quite happy actually to come in on a Sunday as well. So the, the model is 
group sessions again there's no running away from that model as efficient or effective or ineffective you might have found it to be it's the most practical to be able to see numbers or volumes yeah so it's usually group sessions we try and limit four patients or four clients to a group and we try as much as possible to have one to two therapies per group and we would utilize so in at our center we would have perhaps five therapists myself included or maybe six altogether and we might at that point also have a student or some student that is interning that is interested in this work that is able to come in and provide extra support at a table so that that would make up two but most times it ends up being one therapist against five you know like in a group with five children but we try very hard not to have that happen so the itinerary of the camp is that on day one we do we arrive nice and early the families would have arrived the day before or rather the afternoon before and have been situated and are ready to start the camps the following day so they never arrive on the day that we start so if they're starting on monday they arrive on sunday and on day one we do the assessments because smile train does have a, an expectation that you know we fill in the, the the patient information and a bit and do an evalu evaluation just you know fulfill the um, the stx expectations or requirements so on the on the platform so we take a photo and we do a case history very very brief one the portal or rather what is a, what Maltred expects us to do has actually been revised and made a bit uh, has been streamlined so that it doesn't take a, a long time and i'll talk about some of the cons because this was a huge con for us in the first year and then we then come up with a therapy plan for each child and we know we are not going to be able to target everything. So this child might come in with this, 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 and that. And then we decide, okay, what's the lowest hanging fruit? And if the lowest hanging fruit, fruit, the lowest hanging fruit actually has to be the compensatory misarticulations. And I say to you, nasal emissions are pretty easy to sort out as well as glottal stops and also all the others that we talked about so we look at what is easy from experience we've worked out what is easy but also it depends with the individual child if what is easy for this child is resolving the glottal stops and that is what we are going to start with because we want at the end of the five days for us to have had impact it is encouraging for the children it's also very motivating for the families as well and we are also doing a recording for smile train smile train wants to know that this is making sense in the long run so we do an, a pre-audio and a post-audio that is made up of so there are basic requirements really so it's made up of the sounds the child repeating the sounds at syllable level and i think at phrase level and then we also will start the therapy work on day one so we always do we have we split up the therapy into three so there's the morning session and then there is the mid-morning session just before lunch and then there's the afternoon session after lunch and we usually close off at about 3 30 or 4 p.m by that time the children are usually exhausted so one other thing in terms of the recruitment we will have children at a, of a certain age we'll have children that are above four years of age we have had two-year-olds in the past we thought it was going to be disastrous but it wasn't so there was they were able and usually the two-year-olds are able to cope with the rigors of the therapy if they don't have additional language issues so if they, they need to have a bit of maturity and maturity is dictated by how much language they have and so then day two to day four is just focused therapy work. We, we would start the day with just convening just the therapy so, together. So we, we, look, we review the day before, we look at the group dynamics. Do we need to change a child from one group to another because of either whatever issue that we've determined to be an issue? Is it that behavior wise they are distracting or rather they need to be in a group with an with older children or where there is an a much more senior therapy so there's just few group dynamics that we'd always discuss usually all our breaks we spend that just talking about how was the session before is the group pretty airtight do we need to do a little bit to to make it more 
efficient to run and for the children to actually benefit better so we do that we it's just so it's a it's a usually very helpful discussion and then before we launch into the 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 groups the breakout groups we have circle time for the children we sing it's usually such a merry time for the children they love being there we do the same rhymes at the beginning and we see how they sound different towards the end of the camp and it's usually so wonderful to see see the parents are usually so inspired as well and the children just love to mingle and the families are usually quite happy to be there as well and then on the last day which is day five we reassess during sorry the to interrupt you mrs lona yes can you kindly summarize so that we can accommodate questions and answers from our attendees please okay so we we would do the reassessment at the beginning just so that we can provide information for the stx which is a smile train portal and then on this last day as well we talk to parents more about what it is that they can carry on practice with at home we if we've identified areas that i we feel further evaluations required then we also offer that during the parent training on that last day as well and so this is a session. So this session has five children. We did feel like these children were well suited to, to be in this group. And I think we've talked about that. As I said, there's always just room for flexibility in terms of how it is you select the groups and how the dynamics of the camp and how it runs. Do you want each group to be basically based on the child's age or the errors that they are presenting with. So we've trialed both and we've just found that we always just maintain a level of flexibility. And then, so some of the pros to this, obviously you have the families there, they enjoy having to, you know, like be in each other's company. They are seeing children who look like they are each themselves. The families are seeing children who look like their own children. So it has very many psychosocial benefits. We also are able to identify many other areas or comorbidities for the children that would be an obstacle for their language and speech development, like hearing issues. And being the location of our camp is usually situated near, you know, like two hospitals actually that are side by side. It's very ideal location. And if you find that there's a child we suspect is not hearing very well, we can send them off to the audiologist and that can be sorted. And they'll continue to stay for the rest of the camp. But then we, we then are very realistic that that camp is not going to be the one that is going to solve their errors because that hearing issue would need to be sorted out first but as i said they have an opportunity to attend the following session as well so there are cons and some of these cons you i think can deduce you know there are children who come with errors that really the, the session ends up being a waste for them the the cost obviously smile train is having to put up families for a whole week and and feed them and you know that but which then ensures their attendance there are you know many other factors that we really cannot control for the groups as well as much as we try and streamline them they also can present their own challenges and some of the administrative issues with all the evaluations can eat into the therapy work but that has sort of you know been mitigated somewhat by the streamlining of the stx i believe i have done that so thank you so much, Mrs. Lona. Thank you for that informative and educative presentation. We'll now like you to take our questions. So our first question goes thus. When you talk about family camps, does that mean the child and one parent or both parents will be in attendance with the child? Let's take that question first. Thank you. Yes, so that the, the parent, one parent comes and I know in the past, if as long as they are sharing the room, if the parent has an, a younger child that they can't live at home, they usually come with them. And so they spend the entire week or so uh, with us at the camp, yes. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. I hope we've all been able to get the answer to that question. So question two goes does what is the minimum number of therapists that will be ideal to undertake a speech camp? For example, if there are only two speech therapists, is it a good number to embark on a speech camp? Your answer, please. 
so I feel like the success of the camp is very much dependent on those ratios being ideal. So for us, 20, we've actually really struggled with having a group with five children, but we've also been able to tap into other, um, you know, like support of maybe students or interning assistants or paraprofessionals. So if you have two, if you have two therapists at your institution and you'd like to implement a speech camp model, then I would suggest that you train up some paraprofessionals leading up to the camp and you can take advantage of, of the training, the free left training that is currently on offer to anyone, you know, through this partnership of, you know, hearsay and read and smile train. And so if you train up enough paraprofessionals and you at least try and maintain a one to four ratio, so one therapist and four children in a group, then I think that has the makings of being a successful camp. Right. Thank you so much for that. So we have to train volunteers that are interested in working on that with us. Thank you. So question three is this. Yes. During, are there children who... Let me take question three again, please. During patient selection, are there children you had to turn back? That is why they were not deemed fit. If yes, please, what scenario? Okay, so let me take it this way. Are there children you had to return back from the speech camp? If yes, why? Yeah. So we have had children we've taken, we have, we've sent back. And these are the children who have fistulas, for example. So they have structural issues that there's very little we can, there's actually nothing we can do about that. If the trip was too much for them to plan and they're not in a position to leave. We usually just have them stay, but they, they, they are informed that we are probably not going to have a lot of impact. And so we then will contact Smile Train and make sure that they support this family to be able to identify the relevant intervention first. So if it's surgery, so that they can attend the next camp. So yes, we have some children back. For, for the ones that are presented obligatory issues that we can't really mitigate with through behavioral intervention to speech therapy. Okay, thank you. Another question. Are you able to get parents to also meet alongside the children's session to look at challenges and strategies they can continue to use when they go home? Yeah, so we, we always have it open, the groups, they can attend the groups. We have done it for children who we felt needed a parent. They probably didn't have the, they were not as mature or they were very timid and they needed their parent to sit there. If we feel like it's interfering the dynamics of the group, we will say to parents, we will meet up with the parents, the therapist will meet up with the parent during the break times and explain some of the things that they need to do. They're also sent home. All the families are sent home with materials that they can continue to use at home to support their children. But what, I, what we've found is that parents are just happy to come. Most of these parents are so, you know, like they, this, they've, they've done the caregiving for such a long time. They've never had the luxury of somebody else is saying, we are going to look after your, and look after your child or occupy your child for the entire week. So most of them come and they're in holiday mode and they just want to talk to the other parents, which we feel is so beneficial for, for their morale as well and their mental health. So we never, we, we tell them they're allowed to come in, but if they want to sit out, because we will have that parent education thereafter, we, we've been flexible about that. Okay, thank you so much for that. I don't think there's any more questions for you to take, but all in the comment session, they all thank you for a beautiful presentation that is so informative. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much. Uh, okay, okay, hold on. I think there's one more question. Okay, what about security issues? How do you handle security issues? How safe is the camp? So we've been lucky that the location of our camps here in, as I said, it's about 50 kilometers away from Nairobi. It's a very secure area. 
it's actually part of a, a, a hospital. It's a hospital that caters to, um, to mostly orthopedic matters, but it's also just, it's so ideal actually, it's located next to another mission hospital. And actually this area is well known for very lax security, homes don't even have fences. So we are just very, it's very ideal and it has worked for, 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 for the camps. So my suggestion is if you were to run these camps, they need to be run in an institution that provides its own security or is, you know, is, is pretty secure so that they, like we normally leave our staff there and then we commute back to Nairobi, come back the following day and it's usually quite intact. And wherever, like the hall where we present or we have the therapy, we normally will have the security person come and lock it for us. And, but we've never had any security challenges. So we've been lucky in that regard. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that's all the questions we have. And I think that's how we come to the end of today's presentation. Thank you so much for having us teach us about how you go about the camp model and see if we also can also imitate and copy that. So we'll try and work on that too. Thank you so much. It's been quite informative. So if there's no other pleasure. question, there's no other question. I think we've come to the end of today's presentation.